Welcome to episode 152 of the Twim Show. This is your host Sajid Islam and today I'm going over the notable news and updates in the digital marketing space from the week of March 13 through 17, 2023. So today, first off, we're going to begin with Meta. Meta has launched their Meta Verified program to all users in the U.S., That basically means if you are a Facebook or Instagram user, then you can sign up uh, for their blue check mark uh, for $12 a month if you do it from their website or $15 a month if you do it from their app, right? Uh, As per their guidelines, if you want a blue check mark on your Facebook profile as well as your uh, Instagram profile, then you have to pay twice. So basically that brings your cost to $25 a month or approximately $300 a year. Now, what are you going to get for this $300 a year? I mean, $288 uh, to be exact. Well, aside from getting a verification tick mark on your Facebook or Instagram or both, you're going to get proactive account protection for impersonation, dedicated dedicated account support from Meta's team, exclusive stickers for Facebook, Instagram stories, and Facebook reels, and 100 stars a month to allocate to other creators on Facebook. So let's break it down a little bit, okay? First of all, in a year, you get a verification tick. Uh, that used to be a super exclusive thing. That would mean you have arrived or you have done something good. Now something they're giving it out. So basically, you'll be like, yeah, Obama, Trump. You know what? I also have a blue tick mark. So everyone's got a blue tick mark. If you pay, you got a blue tick mark. Okay? So it just loses its luster. Number two, um, you get proactive account protection from impersonation. This should have been a feature of Meta by anyways, right? Doesn't matter whether I pay you $12 a month or not, Meta. If someone is impersonating me and this is a problem that is easily solvable, now you're charging for it. Well, you know what? It, you, I guess in a way it makes sense because, you know, previously or up until now, Meta would allow you to um, cre- impersonate another user because this would add to their total user count. But now that they have a way to mechanism to stop that, maybe, you know, since they're taking a hit on the total user count, total user growth in a given quarter, given month, they're going to charge you for that. That's fine. Dedicated account support from Meta's team. I do not know what the support means, but hey, if that means you are going to look at my account, uh, Facebook account ban and say why I got banned, maybe it's really helpful. I would definitely pay for that. Exclusive stickers for Facebook and Instagram stories, I could care less. Okay, uh, Maybe to you it makes sense. Maybe to a kid it makes sense. But for me as a business owner, it doesn't make any sense. 100 stars a month uh, to allocate to other creators on Facebook. Now, that's amazing. You know, That's just the way uh, Facebook has struggled for months to allocate, uh, uh, get their stars system up, up and going. So now... If I have 100 stars and I know it's going to go to waste, I might as well give some to my favorite creator and that creator gets money now and is built into it. So that's like, you know, um, that creator cashes out. And so that basically gets us into the loop of, uh, you know, spending stars, getting to sometimes, you know. Once you start getting to the habit, eventually they're hoping that this thing is going to catch on, that psychology, and then eventually, you know, maybe Facebook stars are going to catch on. We'll see. Overall, my t- takeaway is that, you know, unless I wouldn't sign up, I wouldn't pay $12 a month, maybe I'm cheap, uh, or $24 a month to get two, two blue check marks. But that's just me, unless, you know, and I'm not big enough for someone to impersonate me. Um, and thirdly, if they have real support for it, to someone to come back and say, hey, your account was banned because you did such and such things, I would buy it and because that's just a lifeline back into Meta. If not, look, $24 here and the $12 with uh, Twitter, that's what, $36. You could say it's cost of doing business, but I think, you know, uh, small thing matters. Like Warren Buffett says, stupid in small things, stupid in big things. I just like to save my money and that's just me unless I see real benefit. I don't need to give someone 100 stars. Then that basically means I have to be on the app which I'm not lately, and I need to spend time to give someone some money, unless, of course, I give it to my friend, and that friend kind of cashes out, and then I get a like, you know, hey, I'm giving 100 stars a month, and off we go. But 
I think that's enough uh, analysis on this program. Let's move on to the next update. The next update here is on Twitter. Twitter has launched this new video uh, course called Unskippable. Uh, it's the good thing about it is that each of those, there are eight videos in this series. Uh, it's on Twitter Flight School. It's free. Uh, I was surprised to see that there's something coming out of Twitter for free it's ever since Elon Musk has been, uh, has taken over. All he has been is like, you know, cost correct cost cutting, cost reduction mode, and I didn't think this would come out. This is done by the Twitter's creative team. Uh, I guess the hope here is that if we create advertisers or if we tell advertisers how to create good videos, maybe they're going to go create more videos and post it on Twitter as an ad. Okay, now... The, so there are two minutes each, eight videos, 16 minutes. So go ahead and check it out. The link is in our uh, show notes page, so you can find it there. The other thing I want to tell you is like since 70% of the advertisers have stopped spending money on Twitter, maybe this is a good time for you to try out Twitter ads. I mean, that many people haven't left Twitter, right? So basically it's a supply and demand thing because now that the demand has dropped because you know you, the inventory has grown, uh, so you know what, you might as well try it out and see how it does. Maybe, you know, it's going to get better results. You should always look for these greener opportunities. People, if you're listening to it, you're in the marketing in world, you're a small business owner, you should look for greener opportunities. This is where you get the leverage. These are the leverage points, okay? Next up on LinkedIn, LinkedIn has created this new thing where you can have AI-generated profile summaries as well as AI-generated job listings, okay? Uh, as the update says, uh, it's self-explanatory, but I will just d dive a little deeper into it. So the what you need to do is go into the your profile and click the tab start button and select what you want to create. The system will come up the with with uh, your LinkedIn profile summary based on your info and samples from millions of user entries. Obviously, it's using OpenAPI's uh, GPT model. LinkedIn is a part of Microsoft company. Microsoft invested into OpenAPI. So that kind of plays out into it. Uh, LinkedIn is also, this is also testing AI-powered job description tool, which should make it easier and faster to write job descriptions. Here's what LinkedIn wrote in the announcement. When you're ready to post a job, simply provide some basic information, including the job title and the company name. Our tool will then generate a suggested job description for your review and edit, save your, saving your time and effort while still giving you the flexibility to customize it to your needs. By streamlining this part of the hiring process, you can focus your energy on more strategic aspects of your job, such as, you know, interviewing. I mean, you know, I didn't save a whole lot of time on this, but I can see why it's needed. Uh, if you're creating new posts, new profiles every other day, but I would think most HR department has already something. Uh, so this is catered to really startups and, you know, small businesses, in my opinion. We'll see. Uh, next up, Microsoft has started the open beta for doctors and clinic ads. Uh, these doctors and clinic ads are intent triggered based on search for conditions, symptoms, specialists, and more. I really like this, right? So if I was searching for, say, uh, I don't know, uh, let's see, I'm blanking out. I do not know why, uh, but what condition could I be? I guess uh, sleep apnea. I don't know. Oh, yeah, because I used to have a client who was in the sleep apnea industry. Okay, sleep apnea. Um, maybe I will get a list of uh, doctors nearby. I like it, right? Especially Bing is usually used by older, the baby boomers. So this would really go do very well, if you ask me, right? Uh, it doesn't require keyword. Uh, you These are dynamically generated ads based on the data you specify in your feed files, such as specialties, location, service type, or in-person or video, stuff like that. The other thing you should other things you need to know that Bing is recommending you start with hundred to five hundred dollars a day. Yes, hundred hundred dollars a day is three thousand dollars a month. I think that's just a very small. Uh, so from three to fifteen thousand dollars a month, uh, that's a small p price to pay if you ask me. Uh, you can bring your own audience uh, list. Uh, and also with Microsoft Audience Network, you can display your ads on a network of uh, Microsoft uh, websites, apps, and other social media platforms, which basically Microsoft owns LinkedIn, so LinkedIn. Uh, and they can also target their ads to specific audiences, such as people interested in health, uh, 
or wellness, health and wellness or people searching for healthcare services. Overall, it's good to see Microsoft being expanding uh, Microsoft or being ads expanding capabilities in their ad offerings. Uh, I think in my Google invest more in hiring offshore reps to trying to dupe advertisers into spending more and more instead of delivering results, whereas Microsoft is thinking, okay, we copied all these features from my, uh, Google. Now what else can we do? Which other verticals can we do? Uh, we'll see if Google's get into this game or not, but I think you know, Google's prominence is at... Um, Google's relevance is at stake. It feels like Google has become the new Yahoo, right? Uh, so, you know, chat GPT came in, now Microsoft is coming in, it's attacking, TikTok is coming in. So we'll see how long Google can hold his uh, crown. Okay, talking about Google, let's talk about uh, Google SEO. Google is saying you should ignore spammy referral link uh, traffic. Uh, so what this basically means is this guy, when he looks at his Google Analytics, he saw a lot of traffic from this spammy side, a lot of referral link, and he's like, it's from .xyz domain. I do not know why this domain shows up on my analytics, why this site is visiting me, um, blah, blah, blah. To that, John Miller says, just ignore it. Now, the question is, how do you filter it, right? This is where you need to work with uh, Google Analytics expert to figure out so that you don't count the traffic because if you count the traffic, here's an example. Say you had 10 visits in this month, last month, okay? Of the 10 vis visits, uh, you know, you had one that converted. So right now, your conversion rate is... Um, 10 over 1 is 10%. Now, of those 10 visits, say five of them were needs to be filtered out and not counted because they were spam. So now you come down to five and you had one conversion. So now your conversion rate is 20%. You see how sometimes looking at the data and cleaning up the data changes the meaning of the data and the effectiveness of your marketing. Right, and if you see that, oh, they're like, oh, wow, twenty percent, right? Uh, so now you can look at, uh, and you can figure out where did I get this valuable traffic from? Who converted? It helps you to kind of. Once you remove that, uh, and when once you filter the bad data, once you remove the bad data, you get to see clearly what you should be doing, uh, and I hope. Uh, this example helps you. This is something I made up as I'm recording this show, so I'm not sure if it really makes sense, but I hope it does. I just wanted to ex drive home the point of uh, having a clean set of data because data drives your decision. Uh, at the same time, the other point you want to know is like you know, if you see some this, uh, spammy referral traffic, just filter them out. Okay. Next up is... Again, on SEO point, it's like just because you have content on your website or your web pages in less common languages such as Cebuano, that does not necessarily mean you have low quality content. Uh, it is still relevant as long as it's good, right? That's what John Mueller wanted all of us to know when he was asked this question. Hey, I have a site with, you know, pages that contents uh, text in Cebuano, as an example, that is used by approximately 22 million people. Uh, it's actually a language in Philippines and one of the regions or one of the islands in the Philippines. So should I remove it from my website or pages because I'm afraid I might get dinged on it or should I just keep it as is and figure out you know, uh, what to do with it, especially if it's already been indexed? Uh, John Miller says, no, if it's good content, keep it. Because someday someone is going to look for it and your page is going to show up. Right? It may not show up every day. It may not be searched for every day. But it's good content. It's out there. It's living there. And it might show up one day. That's one. Number two is like, you know, don't worry don't worry about being penalized uh, because, you know, it's good content and it just doesn't get visited frequently. Number three is that, you know, he's saying, remember, Thin content is always a thin content regardless of what language it is. And good content is always good content regardless of what language it is. So folks, if you're listening to this, all I want you to take away from this update is that always focus on writing good content. Content that will answer people's question. Like now you can say, you know what, how do I anticipate what the people's question are going to be? Well, you know, if you've been in business for a while and you kind of know what are the regular questions, the FAQs, what do questions what questions do people ask all the time if they call you or if they email you or if they ask, if you talk to them in person, write them down, answer them. 
put yourself in the buyer situations or the customer situation, see what questions they may have. And that's going to help you. I hope this helps. Next up is uh, Google really, really wants you to stop using the disavow tool. And this is disavow tool was something that was covered back in episode 137. It was covered back in when um, I forgot the guy's name. Gary Elias was at the PopCon. So what Google is saying, look, John Miller said this again before and Google is again coming, which is John Miller again. Uh, Google, John Miller presents um, Google on the, you know, the social world, so obviously it's Google. But anyway, what John is saying, look, some people will sell the disavow service or the disavow tools because they can make a quick buck out of it. At the end of the day, do not use it unless you have received a manual action. Manual action, aka in Google's world, is basically on the earth. The Google's SEO world is a, it's a penalty. And you will be informed, you will be emailed, but up until that point, don't worry about spammy you know, referral links and disavow tools and things like that. Don't focus on it. It's not worth the effort. Right, You as a small business owner, you are better off taking that effort into something else that will really yield your dividends. Just because a porn site links back to your website does not mean you're going to get impacted. It doesn't happen anymore. It used to at one point. Right, that's what Gary Elias said uh, back in PopCon a few weeks ago. Google has uh, John Miller has been saying it for a while. Like, look at this way: I can easily target. Let's just say my target is this dentist over here, and I can easily put like some links to their website and a porn site, and I can go and create this presentation. And they says, "Hey, Mr. Dentist, look." All these websites are linking to your website and you are getting like, you know, ding and your SEO, you're not showing up. And you know what? I take advantage of them from, from this FUD, fear, uncertainty, discomfort, doubt, whatever you call it. So this FUD, FUD, like if you DD, let's just add a double D. And, you know, they're going to open up their wallet and they're going to probably take off my, you know, services. Now it's a numbers game, right? And you could say, Sajid, how can that be possible? That's so unethical. That's so bad. Well, folks, it's happening, right? Not everyone is ethical out there. That's why you need to work with a reputable, knowledgeable SEO company. Now, you know, we don't provide SEO service as a standalone, but if you need one recommendation, let me know. I will definitely, uh, you know, uh, share a few names. I cannot share one name because that would basically make me biased. I can share a few names that I know are good. And we can, you can talk to them and see who you like and if they you like or not. That's all I can do. But basically going back, stay away from disavow tool. Okay, save your money, save your effort. Okay, next up on the SEO front is nesting, nest, nesting structured data is always better. That comes from Google's Lizzie Sassman from during Google's SEO office hours. Nesting is basically means combining. So say... And here's the example she used, and I'm going to copy the same example and drive home the point. Say you have a website, it talks about recipes, and you have a recipe structured data, and you have the review structured data. The user was asking, hey, do I put the uh, recipe structured data in one section, and do I put the um, review structured data down in another section? So basically, if you took the HTML page, Maybe on the top you say, hey, Google, this page is about recipe. So you put the recipe and then you're putting in down below, you're putting in the review, right? So that was the question. So do I do that or do I combine it? Do I put the review structured data inside of the recipe structured data, right? Which one is right? So Lizzie says, you know what? The latter is right, which is basically you take the recipe structured data and you put embed the review data because then it's telling Google that this recipe has received this review. If you put it separately, what Google is not gonna know is, is it gonna be, are they, again, Google is computer, right? It's algorithm, it's machine. So it wouldn't really, it's not smart enough to say, well, this, this review is tied to this uh, recipe and they should be like that, right? That's where humans excel, to connect the dots, to get meaning out of data, to get meanings out of two things in the same page. But, you know, 
machines are can only do so much maybe it's not smart enough maybe it will be smart in the future but coming back nesting which is combining depending on how you say it but usually it's called nesting but you could say combining nesting is always better if you have a website uh, definitely you have to use structured data structured data is something we have covered a lot in the past so i'm not going deep into it but i just want you to leave this show knowing that you should always use structured data and if you have a product structured data you should put a review inside of the product structured data i've seen a few shopify sites uh, and i haven't seen that happen right and i think i'm not sure how to uh, put embed structured data to a shopify site and this is something i have to look into it but i'm just saying if you have a, a e-commerce store make sure you have the product structured data and then you in that product structured data you can put reviews and all the other stuff that will really be helpful hope this helps let's move on to the last update of this week which is google has launched the broad core algorithm update now google launches core updates infrequently but at least one or twice uh let's see they do run it but they just don't tell you when the next one is going to be this core update started on march 15th it's going to go on for about two weeks it's a global update um again you know it's going to affect all regions and all languages uh, some pages are going to get bumped off the list some pe- pages are going to get higher ranking uh, that does not necessarily mean that you have bad content it could be it is possible that you have bad content and maybe you don't you just have good content but it's just like stale right and one way to think of a core update is to imagine you made up a list of 100 movies in 2021 a few years later which is 2024 you refresh the list so it's going to naturally change some new and wonderful movies that never existed before will now be candidates for inclusion you might also reassess some films and realize they deserved a higher place on the list and then they had before the list will change films Previously higher on that list will that move down aren't necessarily bad. Uh, there are more simply more deserving fi- films that ha- that are coming before them. So hope this example drives home the point what a core update will do. Now, of course, if you experience changes on your pages or your site after the core update, you know, make sure you're still offering the best content. Consider doing an audit of on of the drop that you have experienced, what pages were most impacted and for what type of searches. Look closely at these to understand how these pages may perform against the self-assessment questions. For example, there may be other pages that are doing a better job of helping the searchers because they have first-hand knowledge of the topic. Uh, you might have others you trust. Uh, provide an honest assessment. I have put a link to google's advice on how to recover from a core update ranking drop now like i always say unless seo and search marketing is your you know day job full-time job uh, this is something you don't do to earn a living you should not be really digging deep into the data if you really want to go go into the search console and start shifting through the data figure out do this analysis things like that what you should be doing is you should be working with a reputable uh, agency or a freelancer or a market here who can guide you through this process, right? You as a business owner should not be touching uh, Search Console because it's just too much to learn. And if you end up going into that rabbit hole, what you will do is you're gonna learn, you're gonna be in this learning loop and you're gonna con- constantly do it and then you're gonna be like, oh yeah, man, I thought I was gonna, I was gonna run this, uh, you know, I don't know, this phone shop, but now I find myself running this uh, phone shop, plus I have a full-time SEO job. Now who's gonna do my finances? Who's gonna do my expansion strategy, things like that, and off you go. You are like, you know, you are neglecting your health, you're neglecting your family, you're neglecting your spirituality, your religion, whatever, and everything is gonna come crashing down, right? So I hope this kind of drives home the point uh, really, it doesn't have to be us. And most of likely, we will not take any new clients. So it has to be someone that we will probably refer to unless, you know, you say, you know what, I will do the job if you guide me. That's a different thing. But I'm not trying to sell my services here. All I'm trying to tell you is that, folks, it's high time you get this knowledge. So now, you know, huh, there's a broad core update. Let me go and see, you know, if we got impacted. Who, who can help me find this answer? right? Who can help me guide through this process? That's what you want. You don't want to be like, you know, let me jump into the driver's seat. Let me go roll up my sleeves. Let me learn all these things. I see you thing. And because tomorrow something new is going to come. Next week, something new is going to come. 
Are you going to again go and run your business or are you going to go become an SEO, SEM marketer? That's a question for you. With that, folks, uh, I end this week's marketing, uh, this week in marketing. Uh, until next week, take care. Bye-bye.